Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Let's Play Neo, meaning Benevolent King. Neo was right up there with Final Fantasy XV and The Last Guardian in terms of lengthy spans in development hell, even though it didn't have the same pedigree or notoriety as them. Which is why you might not know that Neo was announced in 2004. Even Final Fantasy Versus 13 only started development in 2006. The project changed hands to Team Ninja eventually, and now we are here. And thankfully, even though it spent so long in development hell, it turned out really well. We're gonna go ahead and get rolling. Before I do, though, I want to show off one of my favorite things about Neo, a feature which every game should have. So do you want to play with the best possible image quality locked at 30 FPS? Do you want that a variable frame rate, or do you want to sacrifice a little fidelity for 60 FPS? That's a no-brainer for me. We're playing at 60. You can't really beat the smoothness and responsiveness of that. And it's not exactly a bad-looking game on action mode. To the far east lies Zapangu. A land brimming with golden palaces and sparkling jewels. Kublai Khan, ruler of the Mongol Empire, sent a large army there, but the warriors of Zapangu used miraculous stones to put up a strong defense. From the diary of Marco Polo. The Tower of London is an imposing fortress built by King William I in order to keep London safe. It has since gone on to be used as a prison for traitors and execution grounds for criminals. Londoners believe that if the many crows living within its walls were to abandon it, the tower would collapse and London itself would be destroyed. It seems death won't stop chasing me. This is our boy William Adams locked in his cell to rot in the Tower of London. He awakens with this mythical guardian spirit guiding him to kick out a wall and bust out of jail. You can turn left out of the cell and fight the guard barehanded, or you can cut right and get rewarded with boots and a sword, which he just knows how to use. While you were rotting in jail, William studied the blade. What are you doing? And immediately, it's so fast! 
you are incredibly agile. Uh, you are more swift, more agile, more mobile than you are in even Bloodborne. And you know how much I love the speed of Bloodborne. Look at this dash. Look at it. I'm a happy boy when you give me a dash like that. Happy boy. Now, before we get too far, uh, Neo is actually deeply rooted in mythology and history. Alternative history, but history nonetheless. Uh, William was commissioned by the East India Trading Company, William Adams that is to say, uh, to sail to Japan. Five ships set sail, only Adams's ship made it. He was the first Englishman to ever reach Japan, and he went on to become an advisor to the Tokugawa Shogunate. And he also became the first samurai to hail from the West. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we're still we're still locked up in the Tower of London. That all that stuff that I just said, by the way, is based on the actual history of William Adams. And of course, this is gonna blend a lot of. Uh, Really cool Japanese mythology, which I can dig into. Really gives me an excuse to go out of my way and research that stuff. Oh, buddy, you tried. Bless your heart, you tried. So for now, they keep it pretty basic. You start with a sword. Uh, you can pick up a couple of weapons, like you can pick up the axe, the, the spear, in a little bit. But they keep it pretty basic for now. Uh, I can also do a finishing blow while he's down on the ground. So you start with a sword, you only have the mid stance. Uh, you have a string of light attacks and a string of heavy attacks. We can lock on to enemies one at a time. Uh, and in this opening level, they won't often throw more than one at you. Sometimes they'll force you to, to fight two at once or to figure out how to split them up. Uh, but it's really just getting you acclimated. And we come to our first shrine. This is going to act as a bonfire or a checkpoint. You're going to hear me using Souls uh, terms interchangeably, like Amrita. It's basically one of our main currencies. It's Souls. I couldn't... Ah, whoops. It was like a split second too late hitting the button. Uh, I couldn't bring myself to consistently call Blood Echoes what they were, uh, and there is little to no chance I'm going to call Amrita Amrita consistently. But right now we're just dipping our toes in. Uh, in combat you can dash around as you've seen me ecstatically do. It feels so, so good. And you have iframes on the dash. Not as many as you would think if you're accustomed to Bloodborne, though. Uh, so we have a chest back here in this room. There's going to be a lot of looting in this. Uh, this is a... Mm, a much more traditional RPG in the way it treats itemization and loot. There's a lot of randomization and just a lot of stuff they throw at you. Right now, in the beginning, you don't have to worry too much about the granular stuff. Uh, we'll get really broad, deep systems introduced uh, as we get into the second mission.
It's talking about some pious from eternal darkness build the pillar of flesh shit. Praise be to Ulya, the corpus god, and all the divines. Pargon, Pargon, Pargon. Oh my god! He's got this fantastic mental image of Virgil and DMC3 going, I need more Pargon. Pargon controls everything. And without Pargon, you cannot protect anyone. I'll put a fancy coat on. And we'll equip the medicine we got. Damn, pants too, why not? It's not really worth noting too much about the stamina bar, which governs most of our actions right now, is we'll get some deeper systems that add a layer of complexity to how we manage stamina uh, once we start the first proper mission. This is much more of a tutorial. Uh, even though there is a tutorialized dojo that they give you access to out uh, after you free yourself from the Tower of London. And look what we have here! We got a big ol' shortcut door leading back to the shrine. Perfect. A little sneak preview that they know what they're doing with the level design. So Emrina has been referenced as the Philosopher's Stone which is like the holy grail of alchemy. Which is fitting because the man who we saw through the bars in the door, the guy draped all in black, he is the antagonist of the game and his name is Edward Kelly. Edward Kelly is a name that you might be familiar with from history. Yes, that's the Edward Kelly that we are uh, up against in this game. The Renaissance alchemist who claimed to be able to summon and communicate with angels and transmute lead into gold and into the Philosopher's Stone itself. I cannot fucking wait until we get to dive deeper into that one. Cause, uh... He was, uh, an eccentric fellow. Oh, you stand no chance. I may have missed a chest somewhere in here, uh, which in the long run is not that big of a deal. Because uh, normally I would have a stone to throw by now, which you would think is pretty similar to Bloodborne's pebble. Which was a fantastic item in Bloodborne. The stones in Neo, I think, are supposed to serve the same function, pulling enemies out of packs. Uh, but they don't. They kind of suck. I mean, I'll show it off, but the pebble, the, the stones in this really do suck for uh, pulling enemies towards you. Because the problem is, when you throw a stone at an enemy, they don't separate from their group. You'll, if you aggro one enemy, you will aggro the whole pack. Uh, back here, there's a dude with a, a bow or a crossbow. Yeah, it's a crossbow. And him, uh, the guy with the crossbow will not come out of his corner to try to get line of sight on you. So as long as you break line of sight, you can pull the other one to fight one-on-one. -on -one. Then he's easy pickings. Ooh, whoops. Underestimated the active frames on that. Uh, so... Coming up is the first point in the game where I ever realized how shitty the stones are. Because after we dispatch this guy who has his back to us... Ah, oh, I didn't get that cool running slash. Uh, after we dispatch this guy... We're going to come to the first for real enemies in the game. The first serious ones. Uh, these knights, fully clad in armor up here. We can lock onto one. We can get a stone tossed in one. He is not going to come to us alone. We are going to get a chance to combo him, though. Ah! You can see you don't have as many active frames on the dodge as you did in Bloodborne. But since the game... Oh my god, I love this dodge! Everything about it feels perfect and satisfying. And it's like, especially once you get that after image going. Oh, holy shit! So good. Um... So you don't spend quite as often in this game relying purely on the iframes from the roll. 
Uh, instead, because you cover so much distance with it, and because you're just so fast on foot, you get to play this footsie game with the enemies. Spacing is something that's really, really important in Neo. And that's why you're, you're primarily so fleet-footed. You can really dance in and out of ranges. Oops. You also really have to watch your stamina. Again, we'll get more into that, that uh, the deeper complexities of the systems uh, once they start throwing some more important stuff at us, like the key pulse mechanic next time. Uh, but just keep in mind that stamina management is more important than Neo than it has ever been in a Souls game. Because if you run out, the consequences are fairly dire. Now, there was another way that we could have gone about that. We didn't have to fight those two knights. Woo! You're, uh, trying. Because as you'll see in a sec, once we kill this guy, uh, there was a poor colorist that we could have gone in down the street that would have left, uh, uh, looped back around right into that tower. So we could have bypassed the knights entirely. But it's not the only time that we're going to have to fight those knights if we want to get everything in the level, so... You know what? It it was worth fighting them just for the experience and getting used to fighting uh, slightly more durable enemies two-on-one. Especially enemies that can combo you. The, uh, the one with the sword is not very bad. He hits hard, but he usually only swings once. The guy with the axe, on the other hand, can combo you to death. And... Yeah, no, stone's fucking worthless. <clears throat> it's a shame, because I love the pebble in Bloodborne. Which is amazing, the fucking description on that thing was... How thrilling. Really, the pebble was MVP of that game in a lot of situations. Uh, Souls games are notorious for... Uh, being quite a bit harder once you get into two-on-one -on -one or any kind of uh, multi-man fight. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One-on-one, -on -one, most enemies are not that bad. Uh, Neo has a lot of really hard one-on-one -on -one fights, though. Uh, the difficulty in this game in general is quite high. But two-on-one, -on -one, generally speaking, in Soulsborne games and Neo, uh, you are severely disadvantaged. Come over here, we'll get a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Lots of it. Tons of it. How can I get up there? Well, we know how to get up the tower. Uh, this is more of a side path that we're taking right now. <laughs> he got it hard. I think he flew off into space. Ah, uh, we did get a breastplate. But we might keep the uh, equipment loan pretty low. There is equip load, uh, as you would expect. Hopefully, this one at least comes alone, because there are two... Ah, well. Problematic. So, this is going to be a test, once again, of uh, spacing and patience. And stamina management. You don't want to let that dip low. Again, there are some dire consequences for running out of stamina. Especially if you get caught once you run out of stamina. Uh, you go into, like, uh, basically a guard-broken state. It would be akin to, uh, in Dark Souls, if you run out of stamina while you have your shield up, is actually what happens. Except it takes a lot longer for you to recover in Neo. So for the most part, this is a need to just finish you and get this down to a one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, and we did it without even getting clipped. This is a... Oh, it's such a fun dance to do. You're so light on your feet. This is a heavily Souls-inspired game, as you could probably tell. Um, I don't know if I agree that Demon Souls birthed the new genre, as some people say, but if you were so inclined, you could call this a souls light. But talking about it in terms of Soulsborne kind of does it a disservice. Uh, especially because 
the first level holds so much back so as to not overwhelm you with complicated systems right off the bat. Well, you're still getting used to how the control setup is. Which, by the way, uh, is very similar to Souls, except it uses more of an action game uh, layout. Like an, uh, It leans more heavily on the action. So it's using like square and triangle for light and heavy attack. Uh, the guard button is the same. There is one major change that we're not going to get to see yet that they make to the control layout, which from software should be ashamed of themselves that they haven't implemented it yet. And it's the control for the bow, the bow and arrow. Uh, we'll see that next time on the next episode. But they introduced so many things that set Neo apart uh, mechanically. And they'll be doing that very soon. That is how they will deliver a lot of, like, uh, non-essential bits of lore, is through, uh, those kind of dialogue sequences. They're almost like, like, kind of ghostly audio logs. Uh, but the comparison I would make is that, uh, humans and chimps. Humans and chimps share, what, 96% of our DNA? Uh, humans and chimps share, what, 96% of the same genes? And yet, look how different we are. I think that's a valid analogy for how Souls and Neo are. Oh, and we could mess around with a spear if we wanted to. We'll get plenty of opportunities to mess around with different weapon types, and we'll even get to pick our primary weapon by the end of the Tower of London. <clears throat> Nothing under this staircase. There was before when we started out. Man, I wish we got to keep this bastard sword for a while longer. Uh, excuse me. Well, before we take a step further, let's see if we picked up a better bastard sword. We should have by now. We picked up the axe, too. No hammer yet. None of the really, really fun stuff. Certainly not my favorite weapon type in the game yet. We will be getting our hands on that very shortly, though. So... Derek the Executioner, our first boss. He, like many others, is based on a real person. But, uh, you can see we're doing some real damage to him. He's not gonna last long, so we're gonna wait a sec to talk about him. Now he's the proper boss. He's not gonna go down in like three or four hits like uh, the first form did. And the most dangerous thing that he does is just that snow plow attack. The Dungeries uh, thing. Uh, Thomas Derrick was a rapist pardoned by the Earl of Essex on the condition that he became an executioner. And he went on to kill something like 3,000 people in his life, including the Earl who pardoned him. Sometimes history has an ironic sense of humor. But that's the, uh, the real life Derek the Executioner. And when he gets down to about this level of health, 
uh, you can activate Living Weapon to finish him instantly. During two years' voyage, the Helloff was lost, the trow sank, while the hope vanished without a trace. The good news of the Blyder Boat's Hap was nothing but lies. Only Leifda remained. twist for what awaited us in the far east wasn't love it was monsters and death Before I begin my preparations for landfall, I leaf once more through that curious book I had chanced upon. Recorded inside are the memoirs of a sailor who had once paid visit to the land of Zbongo. Precisely how the document wound up in the hold of this ship, when its author clearly belonged to the crew of a different boat, is beyond me, but here I am poring over its pages all the same. And not the very first time this voyage, I may add. What fascinated me above all else were the memoirs' many accounts of Zbongo's diverse armor and weaponry. This is where we get to choose our primary weapon, kind of like um, Bloodborne. This is the weapon that we're going to start the proper game with. Uh, so we can go with the dual swords, the regular katana, uh, the spear, the axe, or my favorite, the Kasarigama. One of these things is not like the other. The sailor from the memoir seems to have spent quite some time in Zapongu. He succeeded in keeping the company of samurai writes in detail of establishments in Zapongu called Dojo, where people including samurai congregate for instruction in the martial disciplines. Just reading the sailor's vivid accounts, I feel as though I'm there in the flesh, watching these warriors as they train. The samurai is a master of many armaments and trains for combat in every imaginable scenario. If I were to use another weapon, which one would I choose? So you get to choose two to start off with. And you get a bonus attribute, uh, a bonus skill point. It's like choosing your class. Let's go with the, hmm, 
dual swords or spear? It's hard. We're going to be picking up a lot of these weapon types. Uh, skill, I think, scales a little bit better with Kasari Gama. I might be wrong off the top of my head. The memoir also asserts that samurai are knowledgeable in the martial arts. First, they know which fighting stance to use in each situation, high, mid, or low. Second, after each attack, they ready themselves for the next strike by focusing their key or inner energy. Third, once their key is ready, the samurai can use purification techniques to rid their surroundings of malevolence. This is all introducing a couple of really important mechanics right before we dive into the next mission. The memoir states that Mongu is home to 8 million gods and other deities. Exactly how this figure was derived, I can only imagine, but as I cast my gaze to the shore, I am struck by the sensation that some mystical power has been keeping watch over me. It's the energy that reminds me of Seu or Seoris? Se ah man, I don't know. I pull the memoir one I pull out the memoir once more and survey each page. And this is where we choose our starting guardian spirit. Uh, they'll imbue you with different attribute bonuses to start off with. They also do slightly different things we'll learn about momentarily. We have the shark, the fire pupper, and Daibawashi the bird. Uh, the shark starts you with bonus spirit, and this one strengthens your attack power to start off with, and imbues uh, your living weapon with fire properties. So we'll go with uh, Fire Amaterasu, little fire pupper, hot doggo, <laughs> the hot doggo. Uh, the dinghy's been ready for us to make landfall, blah, blah, blah. Put my memoir down, I put the memoir down, and leave my cabin. Kurushima is a tiny island off the coast of Asuki in Kyushu's Bungo province. There's a little in the way of usable land, with coastline rapidly giving way to cliffs and mountains, Clinging to its edge is the smallest of fishing villages, its residents eking out subsistence, farming on plots carved out from the hills. Their frugal lives start, uh, stand in stark contrast to the village elder whose opulent mansion perches atop the island's tallest peak, strangely oversized for the small island which it overlooks. Here we are, in mission two of the game, which is much more of a proper mission where we get access to all of our deeper mechanics at once. That's gonna do it for now. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching everyone, take it easy, have a good one. Oh, what do we have for gestures? I haven't looked at these yet. We'd have the bow, yeah. All right.